Hello everybody, it's Professor Fiori. In this video, we are going to take a look at the low frequency performance of a JFET common gate amplifier. One of these. All right, common gate, you might recall, uh, is notable for the fact that it has a low input impedance compared to other FET amplifiers, has a decent voltage gain that is non-inverting. All right, so the gate is the common terminal down here input on the source, output on the drain. Now, the bias that I'm using here is a self-bias. This is the same bias setup that we used in the uh, introductory common gate video, common gate amplifier video. So I'm gonna run through the DC performance of this very quickly. If you want a little detail on that, a little bit slower, I suggest you go back and look at that other video, right? The, the introductory common gate amplifier video. The specs that we're starting off with are a GM0 of 3.17 millisiemens, a VGS off of negative 2.88 volts, and an IDSS of 4.56 mils. So you could use a self-bias on this, right? Gates at ground, you just have the RS coming off the source. And that's really the definition of self-bias, if you remember, is that the drop across RS is VGS. And here you can see it really well right, the, the source gate voltage and the RS voltage um, must be the same, all right? So it's self-bias. So what we would do is uh, take your GM0 RS, find that product on the self-bias curve, and from that you can get the ID to IDSS ratio. From there, we can find the ID value, and then we can solve for GM, which as I said, is in the other video, but I just conveniently stuck it all in here for us. So GM0RS 6.34. From the graph, we get 18%, 0.18 for the ID-IDSS ratio. So if you just multiply that by your IDSS, you come up with a current of just over 0.8 mils. And we can figure out um, GM. GM is GM0 times the square root of that current ratio. That works out to 1.35 millisiemens. Now we can figure out the gain. It's always nice to know what the gain is, right? So that's going to be GMRD, where RD is the AC drain resistance. So that would be this biasing resistor of 6K in parallel with the load of 12. 6 in parallel 12 is gonna give you 4K. And then we just multiply that by the GM, the 1.35 millisiemens, and we get 5.4, which is a little over 14 decibels. So first, let's do a quick DC analysis just to make sure that everything is where it should be. All righty. So I look at RS, uh, we're getting 1.6 volts, we're getting a, just a little over 800 mics, right? Uh, about 0.8 mils, so that looks good. I'm happy with that. Now we can go and uh, do a really quick transient analysis. Make sure that we're getting an in-phase signal that's you know, somewhere around five times bigger. All right. Okay. Now don't forget the common gate. And this is a thing that a lot of people forget. You know, uh, people think in terms of a... Um, uh, a, a FET amplifier is always having a really high input impedance. And that's true if you're driving the gate. But if you're not driving the gate like we are here, you know, the input impedance doesn't have to be that big. So even though you see a 50 ohm source impedance, you could still be losing some signal across that. All right, you know, how big is this? Well, you know, it's probably going to be less than a K ohm, you know, several hundred ohms anyway. You are going to lose a few percent across here. But in any case, let's just double check what's going on, right? Okay, so here's our VGen. Obviously in phase, I'm getting a little tiny phase shift because of the capacitors themselves. But, you know, looks pretty good, right? The amplitude, we seem to be a little shy where I'm getting a little bit of asymmetry. Notice over here, you know, this is, this is uh, uh, 50 mils positive, this is 50 mils negative. We can see the negative peak is much closer to the, that desired point. Of, uh, of about 50. So we're getting a little asymmetry, which means we're getting a little distortion, which probably isn't too surprising, to be honest with you, right? You know, there's like no swamping or anything in here. So uh, the bottom line is it appears to be working 
pretty much the way you expect it to work. All right. Now, shift gears. Let's go look at the lead network response, low frequency response. That's what we're here for. All right. So on the front end, off the generator, we have the generator internal impedance, the input capacitor, and remember it's always coupling capacitors and bypass caps that create these lead networks. We don't have any bypass caps here, just have coupling. So input and output coupling that creates two networks, an input network and an output network. So on the one side of this 100 mic, we have the 50. On the other side, we have RS, the biasing resistor at 2K, and that's in parallel with whatever Z into the source is. Now you might recall that Z into the source is equal to one over the GM, and we know what the GM is. So we can figure that out, and then those two things, right, this parallel combo plus this, wind up being in series. On the output end, it's a similar sort of situation, right? Your uh, DC voltage source gets shorted. You're doing a, like a Thevenin superposition kind of thing here, right? So you short this out, the RD comes down to ground. We can ignore the internal impedance of the FET current source because it's big enough. You put it in parallel with 6K, you're just gonna get 6K. And then that winds up being in series with the 12K. Take a look at that a little bit a little bit more accurately, right? So here's the front end network, your uh, CN of 100 mics, the generator impedance, here's the RS. The ZN source, right, is one over GM. We know GM is 1.35 millisiemens, so you take the reciprocal of that, you get 741 ohms. So this combo, 2K in parallel with 741, winds up being in series with the 50. That's your R value, you know the C value, plug it into your equation, you know, one over two pi RC, and you've got your input critical frequency. On the output end, you got your cap right here. Off to the right-hand side is the 12K load. Off to the left-hand side, we see the 6K. That's in parallel with this impedance, which is the internal impedance of the current source, which, like I said, big enough to ignore, right? You know, hundreds of K ohms anyway. So you put that in parallel with 6K, and you're basically going to get 6K. So from the Position of the cap, you're looking at basically 6K off to this side and then 12K off to that side, 18K total. So we can take that with the cap, again, put it into the critical frequency equation, and we've got our critical frequency. Right there, all right? So recap on the input. We can see the Z in source, 1 over GM is 741. Add the 50 ohms to the parallel combo of, of uh, the 2K and Z in source. So that is going to get you 591 ohms from the position of the capacitor. Take your 100 mics, run that through your equation, 2.7 hertz. That's the critical frequency on the front end. On the output end, like we said, 6K and 12K add up. There's 18K. You've got a 100 nanofarad cap. That grinds out to 88.8 hertz. Now, of the two, clearly the output is the dominant network. It's the one that affects the mid-band response first, right? Just imagine sitting up here at the mid-band mid and then working your way down in frequency, right? The curve's going like that. It's dropping off. So the first one to hit, right, is the higher of the two, right? So we got the 88.8 and the 2.7. So that's what we would expect when we do a Bode plot for this. We expect, you know, 85, 90 hertz, somewhere around there. There might be a little bit of interaction, you know, um, probably a tenth of a dB maybe. It's going to be really small because that is more than a decade. You know, that's kind of the rule of thumb that I use. If you're beyond a decade, there's going to be very little inter interaction. You know, if it was an octave, you know, if this was like 40 hertz or 50 hertz, yeah, there'd definitely be some noticeable interaction. But in this case, well, we're going to be pretty, pretty close to this predicted value. At least we should be. All right, so let's go back to our original circuit. And um, I've summarized those down here below so we can uh, have them conveniently located. All right, 2.788. Let's go up and check the Bode plot here. So I'm going to go from 100 milli, uh, millihertz, sounds odd, 0.1 hertz, to 100 kilohertz. I'm going to increase that to 200 points. See what we get. All right. 
So first, check out what our gain is. Right, we were expecting, I think it was somewhere around 14-ish. Yeah, 14.6. So we're a little shy of that, which I'm not surprised given the fact that we had a, a bit of distortion when we did the transient analysis. All right, so we're getting 13.3. You know, um, and really, you know, that's about a dB. And you know, if you're talking uh, you know, like an audio thing, right, you know, a dB is like just barely just barely noticeable for most frequencies and amplitudes. At some frequencies, you can dis discern more than a decibel, but um, particularly at very low frequencies, you know, a dB, you change an amplitude by a dB, and eh, you can't even really tell you changed it. But in any case, we're sitting out here at three point, roughly 13.3, uh, so I want to lose 3 dB from that. In other words, I want to be somewhere around 10.3, right? Let's see where that is. Uh, right in this region right here. So that's, um, well, depending on which, which way we go. 88.2, uh, 88.6. 88, All right, somewhere around 88 and a little bit more. <laughs> All right. So we, we had predicted 88.8. .8. So, you know, I think, we're, I think we're successful, right? I think we can say that we are successful. We just don't have enough um, resolution on the graph itself. So we're pretty much there, right? Looking good. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Now notice this slope and this slope, right? So this is a shallower slope because right around here, just looking at it, you can see this is where the other network, the input network is kicking in, which was, you know, two hertz and change. So here's one, there's two hertz right there. And you can see that's right where the inflection point is, right? So this is a single network. And then right here, the second network kicks in. So the slope is two networks, 6 dB per octave each. In other words, 12 dB per octave, or if you prefer, 40 dB per decade. That's what we're looking at. Speaking of which, how do we now go back and verify the 2.7 hertz? Speak up, I can't hear you. Okay, right. What we do is, we've seen this before, because in the lead network analysis, it's just the capacitor values that, you know, a single capacitor value that affects the overall response, and they don't affect the bias or the gain in the midband and things like that. They're kind of nicely isolated, right? Un unlike some of the other components. Um, you know, change RD, well, yeah, you can change the critical frequency, but you're all gonna cha also change the gain, okay? Multiple things happen. So these are nicely isolated. So what we do is we simply change the values so that we can get a different network to be critical, all right? Now you could kind of go either way. So, you know, a lot of times I change a cap, I make a cap smaller so that, um, you know, the, the one that we're interested in becomes critical, right? Well, you could go the other way. You could make a, a you know, the, the current dominant network, you could make that cap a lot bigger. And that would make the, other one now dominant. So you know, for example, out here in the in the output network, right, 88.8 .8 was the uh, the dominant network that's sitting out, out here with a um, 100 nanofarads. Well, if I put in a much much bigger capacitor, right? So let's say I just in, I increase this by a factor of a thousand, make it 100 microfarads. All right. So this is kind of the opposite of what I typically do in these videos. So I make this 100 microfarads, um, with that factor of 1,000, this frequency should go down by a factor of 1,000. So in other words, we go from 88.8 .8 hertz to 88.8 .8 millihertz. 0 0.088 hertz, in other words. And in that case, the 2.7 now becomes dominant. All right. Hey, 2.7 versus 0 0.088 hertz. Okay. So let's try this one out. Let's see what we get. Hey, what do you think is going to happen? Okie dokie. Let's try the blue one this time. So here we are again, 13.3. Uh, we want to go three down from that, so about 10.3. Yoinkies. Right around, well, that's pretty close. So we're getting uh, just about 2.6, okay? 
we're not right on the money, but that's yeah, probably a little too far. You know. Um, so anyway, somewhere in that 2.6 range. Okay. Bingo 2.7. Hey, that looks pretty good. All right. So here we are initially, you know, we were looking at, uh, you know, 88, 89. That's what we're getting on the SIM. We crank this capacitor out. We're getting 2.6 versus 2.7. Hey, comes right in. It's really nice. Um, there is one thing, you know, I, I do want to stress again. These FET common gate amplifiers do not have a very high input impedance. So if you want low frequency extension, you are going to have to use a fairly big input coupling capacitor. You know, with with a, a, a common drain or a common source amplifier, that's not the case. You know, the, the ZN is so huge, you can you can get away with really small capacitors out in the front end. But with the common gate, that's not the case. Right? We have to go to uh, you know a kind of value that we would perhaps see it uh, either at the output or uh, maybe on the input of a bipolar amplifier. All right. Okay. Any comments? Any questions? You know, you know where to put those on the video. And we'll see you next time. Take care.